This is a Digital Music Trends, episode 157, on the 7th of November 2013. Digital music in five years' time. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. Today features a panel discussion that I hosted at Social Media Week a few weeks ago, discussing what the next five years in the digital music industry will bring. The panel features representatives from different sides of the industry, including SoundCloud, Songkick, Rolly and Songdrop. Thanks so much for joining us uh, on this first panel and thanks for having us here, it's a fantastic space. And uh, we're going to talk to you today about uh, uh, the latest uh, uh, trends in the music industry, but also looking in the f into the future. Uh, five years from now, what's going to happen, what are going to be the, the trends that stick around and, and those that, uh, that that fade away uh, with time. So uh, we're going to look at both uh, uh, the live industry, the, the consumption uh, side of music and uh, we're going to look at uh, creation which is also a very important point and uh, there's a great panel here of, uh, of speakers uh, they're gonna uh, I'm gonna ask all these things uh, from so uh, first of all uh, we look at uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Thibault uh, who is uh, uh, head of business development at Rolly so hi Jean-Baptiste and great to have you on thank you hi and uh, so what is what does Rolly do and what, what do you guys do there um, so, Rolly is a startup company operating mostly in hardware, so thank you very much for inviting me in the first place. Being in the hardware community is, is quite different to social media, I think it's disconnected, but yeah. we're operating in music and I think there's more and more um, uh, bridges to build between the two and, and we, we now see uh, maybe a sort of small revolution in hardware making. Yeah. I think we're part of that movement of making hardware uh, faster and breaking right. down the barriers to putting a product on the market. So um, Rolly makes a, a new keyboard, an evolution of the, of the piano, uh, which is made of silicon and uh, allows new expressivity. Um, I would invite you to, to look at our, our website. And tomorrow we have a, a great uh, spot on CNN for uh, three minutes. And uh, it's an international. I would invite you to, to watch this. It's going to be very interesting. Great. And if you haven't checked out the Seaboard, you should go on YouTube and definitely check out a few videos for, for that instrument that they're producing. So, and we have uh, Ian Hogarth, uh, CEO and co-founder of Songkick. So hi Ian, and uh, of course, uh, uh, how many of you know about Songkick in the room? Raise your hands. So most of you, but uh, just for the benefit of, of, of the live streaming audience as well, uh, what does Songkick do in that show? Uh, so Songkick uh, helps music bands go to more concerts and artists sell more tickets. Um, we're the second largest concert site in the world after Ticketmaster with about 8 million monthly unique uh, users on iOS, Android and web. Awesome. And uh, Dave Haynes, uh, who's a VP uh, of uh, Business Development at SoundCloud. Uh, so hi, Dave, and thanks for joining us and uh, organizing most of this panel, actually. <laughs> so, uh, so SoundCloud, again, a company that most people will know about. Uh, in a nutshell, what do you guys do? Oh, so uh, SoundCloud is a platform for sound. Uh, we allow anyone to upload and share their sounds and, and find their audience. Um, we have over 10 hours of sound every single minute um, which kind of always blows me away when I when I say that fact um, and we also have um, over 200 million uh, uh, unique visits on uh, on kind of SoundCloud in all its forms so on the website on our mobile apps but also across all the, the little player widgets that you'll have seen with our kind of trademark waveform so yeah that's SoundCloud hopefully you've seen us somewhere on the web great and finally we have uh, uh, Brittany Bean who's the CEO and co-founder of SoundDrop so hi Brittany and thanks for joining us uh, what is SoundDrop? Uh, Songdrop is a way to listen to music from loads of different sources. It's like kind of like a record player for the internet. So you can listen to music from YouTube, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, Vimeo, Vivo, depending on their attitude on the day, um, and MP3s <laughs> on blogs. Um, we are uh, web first and uh, recently mobile. Um, so we have an iOS app available now. That's great. Well, thanks so much for, for being here. And uh, so today we're going to look at the trends uh, for the music industry for the next, fi uh, next five years, as I mentioned at the beginning. And so I guess uh, I would ask you all to sort of uh, take a leap of uh, faith and uh, forget about the companies you work for, you know, in, in a sense, uh, and just draw from your experience. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we won't make uh, tools of ourselves uh, if we look at this in five years' time and, and realize that we're completely wrong in, in, in our assumptions. And so uh, first of all, uh, we're going to talk about the music consumption space. So. Uh, Streaming is, of course, a massive trend in the music industry at the moment, uh, and uh, it's going to continue to grow. Uh, there's a lot of speculation as to whether that's going to uh, completely kill uh, CDs and downloads. Uh, you know, people were predicting this 10 years ago, but it hasn't happened yet, and uh, you know that it's going to be a long time before we see that uh, happen, I, I believe. But uh, uh, Dave, I guess I can start with you on, on that front because uh, you know SoundCloud is at the forefront of, of streaming. Uh, what are your thoughts on streaming replacing traditional uh, consumption of, of music through downloads and CDs, uh, and what is the timeline for that for you? Yeah, I mean, I think 
uh, I mean, look at this from a kind of, you know, zooming out and looking at the last five years. I mean, I remember doing panels, you know, like this five years ago, and you said even 10 years ago, where you know, the big debate was, you know, about music streaming and, you know, would we move from, you know, ownership to access? And, and I think, you know, if you look at the last five years, it's, you know, those questions have continued to be asked, but the, the real innovation has, has happened around, you know, bringing that play button to every single person wherever they are on any device. Um, and I actually think we've now got there. I mean, the play button is commoditized. You can, like anyone in this room could access any piece of content that they wanted to. You could be paying for it and have a slightly different experience where you could probably access it for free. So, and you've all got devices in your pocket. I mean, and to me, it's just crazy that in that five years time, we've gone from that shift of, oh, I've got my vinyl collection and my CD collection to now I can literally access anything in the world. So I think that's, you know, that's kind of, that's almost like over now, like that, that five years has happened. And I still see a lot of startups kind of coming into that space and trying to tackle that problem. And I actually think largely most of the innovation has happened. Um, and there's only going to be kind of incremental. It's like, I think the next steps aren't necessarily the innovation of how do we get that play button in front of the consumer. It's much more around two things. First of all, the business models of that, because obviously the content that people in the room want to listen to is largely, but not all, um, you know, run by you know like three major record companies and you know a, a big proportion of independent companies as well, um, and they all have their concerns around you know the, the disruption of the technology has completely changed the economics. And again, you could do a whole panel on on that just in itself. Yeah. So I think that's the, the the first kind of you know next step of innovation in that isn't isn't is streaming going to be here? I think it's it's de facto. It's going to replace CD. It's going to replace downloads. It's just a matter of time um, and kind of form factor. Um, but it's how do how do people make a business of that? How do, how can artists make a living off that, whether it's directly or indirectly? And then the second thing there is um, it's more on the front end, so it's more on the user user experience. And I was at another thing yesterday where we were talking about kind of uh, radio and music radio and. And one of the big problems to solve, like now that that play button has been commoditized, now we have that infinite choice. There's almost like a tyranny of choice. Somebody quoted yesterday: "Is you know, everyone's got access to any of that content. So you know, which of the companies, or you know, which of the layers that are going to be built on top of those play buttons um, that can help you find the music that you really love?" Um, and I think it's, I think there we kind of we're, we're talking more about incremental innovation. This isn't, you know, the next five years isn't going to be a sweeping change. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that's kind of one of the one of the main areas to focus on. Sure. And uh, Ian, uh, looking at uh, you, of course, uh, work in the live music industry primarily. But I'm interested in your, your view uh, as a sort of a, somebody that works full time in the music industry, but it's not in the recorded music side of things. But uh, looking at all these companies that are operating in the streaming space, uh, uh, most I mean I don't, I'm not really aware of any company, uh, including. Uh, Spotify, Pandora, uh, all the big ones, uh, to be profitable yet. And so the sustainability is a big question, as, as they pointed out, uh, uh, as to whether these companies are going to be around in five years' time. I mean, most people are saying, you know, that there are, some people are, you know, predicting doom and saying in five years all these companies will have disappeared because they keep losing money. Some people are saying they're just acquiring scale. Once they acquire scale, uh, they're going to be great services and they're going to be able to be profitable. W what are your thoughts on that, uh, looking at the industry from, from a slightly different point of view? That's a pretty loaded question. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think what Dave said is actually completely bang on as, as always, which is that the real innovation is around the business models. And yeah. I think what, you know, as a, as a sort of interested observer of all of this is so interesting to me is that you have really quite different business models sort of sitting out there on the landscape all, all at really significant scale. And they're all kind of, um, I think the, 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 well, I don't think we're going to see a sort of winner-take-all model emerge. I think we're going to see a dominant model and some niche models. And the question is really what's dominant and what's niche. So, you know, I like to think about this mostly um, with regards to YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify and the like, and Bandcamp and the like. Yeah. Um, and to me, you've basically got the, you know, the most scale, the most dominant model right now in YouTube where, you know, Artists of all shapes and sizes, labels of all shapes and sizes, put their music on there. YouTube has literally every piece of content in the world ever um, being played there. The consumer experience it for free. The artist gets paid through ad revenue, or somebody gets paid through ad revenue. Um, then you've got the SoundCloud model, which I think is, in some ways, the most disruptive because it, for, for me, it's always felt like it's reframing the question of what what music is all about, which is um, from an artist's perspective. And I think it's actually about 
a sort of content loss leader that drives discovery and transactions elsewhere. And the artist is playing SoundCloud for the privilege of having their audio on there. And SoundCloud's doing an insanely amazing job of make, getting that audio anywhere it could possibly be from, you know, offline, online players, whatever else. Um, and, you know, obviously SoundCloud may end up doing more on the advertising front, may end up doing more on the consumer monetization side. But it's very interesting that right now, actually, the artist plays SoundCloud. I don't think that's a bad thing, actually. I think that's a very, very exciting thing. Then you've got next down, you've got Spotify, where it's a blended mix of the YouTube ad supported and the subscri subscription model, um, which is obviously the most aligned with the labels want, but the labels are a sort of an older, an older business model themselves. And then finally, you've got uh, the Bandcamp model, where it's in entirely independent artists, similar SoundCloud, except with uh, a sort of ancillary e-commerce applied to that, whether it's buying MP3s or buying tickets or buying merch. And we, we do the ticket stuff with them. So. I think it's really interesting just looking across the sort of smorgasbord of business models here. I think Dave's exactly right that the real innovation is going to be around what the right and dominant model is. And I think it's way too early to call it, but it's really exciting. We have services at scale in each different area there, all of whom will probably learn lessons from each other and eventually trend towards something that is, makes the most sense for fans and artists. Absolutely. Uh, Brittany, uh, your service uh, operates to Consolidate uh, in in a certain way the content that is out there online to bring it all into one uh, one pot. Uh, do, do you feel like fragmentation is an issue at the moment, and how do you feel like the the music space is going to shape up in the next five years to uh, bridge that uh, that fragmentation and and perhaps either create consolidation within the companies that actually manage to uh, stay in business or uh, amongst the content that is uh, uh, put out there by all these different uh, companies? Um, I think fragmentation is a huge issue. It's why we built the product we have. Um, and I mean, it was like born out of frustration. I couldn't listen to stuff, remixes on SoundCloud and things that were on YouTube at the same time. So we made a toy and I turned that into a business for some reason. Um, I think, you know, in the next five years, what we sort of see happening is the sort of, it's kind of a trend into moving away from this kind of traditional rights model. Um, I don't think that that's ever going to go away. I think there's a place for labels and there always will be. Um, but I think what we're seeing now is a lot of artists put their stuff directly onto YouTube or directly onto SoundCloud. And they use that as a monetization platform. Like, you know, especially all these kids coming out, putting things up, having like a million channel subscribers on YouTube and making like way more money than I'll probably ever make when they're 17. And I think that's what's becoming disruptive. And the kind of catalog fragmentation is easily solved. Um, like it's there's other companies out there that do what we do. We, we don't sit on our own little pedestal of coolness. There are other people doing it, and more people will probably come along and do it as well. Um, I think as time goes on, that will become less of a problem because, as Ian and Dave both said, that well, someone's going to win ish, um, be that a business model or a service itself, and there'll be a way to filter that content and have it come in. But I think what is interesting is to look at whether or not a lot of people will choose to avoid a major label path now and choose to monetize themselves and make that money on their own and build their own team without needing to pull one in from a big rights holder. Yeah, absolutely. And Jean-Baptiste, uh, looking at how we are uh, framing the question of uh, music streaming services, uh, there is a lot of debate around uh, curation. Of course, uh, it looks like uh, almost every single streaming service that is uh, uh, out there has got a very similar catalog. Uh, if you look at uh, the likes of Spotify, these are uh, and uh, RDO, for example, uh, and what they're trying to frame the, the question as is, uh, are we making a, doing a better job at uh, serving the catalog to our uh, consumers and making sure that they can find what they, what they like? So how, how do you feel that question of uh, recommendation is going to sh shape up? And is it really the differentiator, or is it just the companies you know, really struggling to create, find a, a way to differenti differentiate themselves from, from a competitor? Well, I would agree with what has been said before about um, the competition in the market is about owning the most music at first, probably. And the second one is the recommendation layer. I think there's a great uh, value in, in getting um, closer to providing people what they really want. And, and sometimes what they want is discover new music. And, uh, and Spotify and a lot of uh, and Pandora has been, uh, have been great at providing that service and some of that as well. Um, I think that. This is one of the major innovations that's going to happen, uh, the refinement of this. And there's an interesting trend in, in research in music these days about music and emotion. 
and uh, going, you know, starting maybe in the, with the cliche of music makes me happy or makes me sad, and well, I want to make music, um, I want music to make me feel in such a way. Uh, emotion is always at the root of our decisions, and uh, we choose music to create an atmosphere of ourselves to feel in a certain way. Um, and research goes uh, in, in very sophisticated details now. And I think if you link all this qualitative data uh, with the more, the more quantitative data of, of existing uh, recommendation services, we will find some very interesting way of, of tailoring more the, the search towards the things that you really want to hear. Yeah. So I, I feel that recommendation uh, is certainly um, one of the great tool and innovation that is going to support uh, better access to, to music. Yeah, of course. Uh, Ian, uh, surprisingly, not surprisingly, but it, it, in a sort of convoluted way, uh, Songkick has become actually a, a, a very important place to pull data from when it comes to uh, finding out what you like. So, you know, if uh, some services are actually uh, allowing you to log in with your Songkick details uh, so that they can pull the data as to what gigs you've been to or what artists you're following on Songkick and then uh, generate recommendations on that front. Is that something that you envisaged when you started the company or is it something that uh, has come about sort of sideways, and how do you feel that's going to progress for, for the company in the next five years? Um, I guess I guess we sort of, uh, I don't think we stumbled into being a, a platform in the sense that we, you know, we've always been huge users of streaming services, and so for us it was really obvious that if we were listening to music somewhere, it'd be really cool to know if the artist was on tour so you can have more of that sort of serendipitous discovery that, oh, I just, I really like this song, and oh, I didn't realize they were on tour. So we've always conceived of ourselves as a platform in that, right? And we have an API that's used by thousands of developers now and, you know, pretty much all of the major major streaming and, and streaming music companies. Um, and that's very exciting because I think it takes discovery out of our own little kind of area and ex extends it into the broader web of, web of streaming. Yeah. Um, in terms of other stuff that we can provide through our platform, I mean, that's they are right. That is very kind of uh, emergent. Like we don't really kind of we can't predict it. Um, and uh, I think actually that will only get richer and more interesting, especially as we start to do more around the actual event itself. Um, you know, we've we've just started doing some quite cool stuff involved in sort of you know being present at the event as, as, a, as a company and doing stuff to facilitate the creation of the event. And I think the more that we actually get into the real world of, of going into a venue and holding up your phone and standing in the crowd, the more cool stuff that we can't predict will be built on top of us as a, as a platform. But very early days there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, Dave, uh, SoundCloud has got a mountain of data, of course, by now uh, on what users are doing, where they're listening, what's happening on that front. And uh, I, I was talking actually last week as well about the, the idea of geolocation as being the next frontier for uh, recommendations uh, and also for allowing people to discover cool new stuff that's happening around them. So uh, how are you planning? Uh, have you got any plans uh, to use that data? Uh, I know it's not being surfaced as much yet uh, uh, through the service. Uh, and, and it's more like a stats issue for artists that they can tell where people are listening from. But as an outward facing service, do you plan to service that or do you already service that as part of your API and how do you see that evolving in the next few years? Yeah. Well, I think I think that the, the, the data question is very interesting because, you know, with a lot of, you know, with uh, for an artist and, you know, at SoundCloud, we, we focus heavily on the creators and not just the consumers. So I think there's one part is, yes, we need to use the data that we have to provide better recommendations, to provide better discover tools, et cetera. But if you, if you flip that on its head and look, look at it the other way, like one of the kind of big disruptions that, that has arisen from that data, um, and not just the data on SoundCloud, but data from Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, like all of this stuff gives gives clues to the to the industry of like what's going to be popular next. So. Um, you know, we, we have quite a lot of an A and R people who will use SoundCloud, and they're like, you know, they dig around because we allow anyone to upload. You know, you're going to find an artist there first, like someone like Lord, who's now kind of, you know, ridiculously popular and on everyone's lips. You know, she said in a, a New York Post article recently that, um, you know, she put her stuff up on SoundCloud first, and that's where she went on. And you know, we have, you know, people like Troy Carter, who late, who's Lady Gaga's manager pingy us saying, hey, I just found this singer-songwriter in Berlin, you know, can I get her details because she's fantastic and, you know, like, we, we 
want to, you know, we think she's going to be the next big thing. So um, I think that's really interesting. And in the in the context of social media, and I, I know a lot of people in the audience are going to be interested in this, there's a, there's a fantastic company called Next Big Sound, and there's, you know, other equivalents like Music Metric here in the UK who are doing a fantastic job of pulling all of that data together. And then it's, it's about turning that data into insight. Yeah. So I can now go to Next Big Sound and I can say, hey, pull me up a list of, um, you know, it, all of the all of the tracks on SoundCloud that have had the most acceleration over the last 90 days, sort that by the most number of followers on Twitter, and, um, you know, only show me the ones that aren't signed to a major label, for example. And that gives me a list. It's like, wow, that's talent. And for the creator, they can use these stats. Like, they're using it now, like, frequently. It used to be that if you wanted to get on the radio or you wanted to get a new manager, you had to kind of go and you had to, it was like a lottery, right? You, you sent your CD off to the radio station, you hope you got picked. Now they can use that data to build a convincing argument. So the, it's, it's given the tools to the artist to build that case and on merit go to the radio station and say, hey, I've now got 10,000 fans and I've had you know, 200,000 sound covers. And so I think the data is helping on both sides of the equation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brittany, uh, looking at your company and uh, the space of uh, aggregating content in general, do you feel like uh, we're going to see a move uh, towards uh, the absence of a, of a steady point to access music through a service? So, for example, people wouldn't go to Spotify to access their Spotify <laughs> collection, but they would use a third-party app that aggregates Spotify and everything else that they have in the cloud. Do you think that's what's going to happen in the next five years? looking at that crystal ball once again, without, you know, uh, preconceptions, I guess. Um, I think that, I think what's, I think an interesting way to look at it is whether or not this, so the sort of ubiquity of the play button, and that you can just kind of play music from anywhere now, really. Um, and it is true, like, you don't have to pay for it. Um, you can find anything you want somewhere for free to listen to. Um, I think what's more interesting is what happens with what's next. Like, what is post-play, basically? Yeah we were going to get a little bit ridiculous about this. Um, and is there a place for looking at what can be done with music that's beyond just playing it and putting it in a list and recommending it to someone? And I think that's where stuff is going to get actually interesting. And it's we've now reached a point where we have access to like every single thing that's ever been recorded ever. And you know, once we're all sort of had our fill and we're done with just playing things back, where are the possibilities there? And I think that's where we're going to see people doing stuff that is really, really interesting. And that's a question of format innovation. And there's a lot of chat about business model innovation, but I think there's still a lot of room for format innovation on top of what's already been done. Um, and that's certainly a place that I'm super interested in. Yeah, sure. Uh, Jean-Baptiste, uh, last question on, on music, on the music front. Uh, uh, there's lots of people are talking about, well, not lots of people, but a few people are very, very uh, vocal about uh, high quality audio. So we've heard uh, about Neil Young's uh, Pono initiative, which is a service that he wants to launch uh, to offer really high quality uh, audio to, to consumers. Uh, and uh, you, of course, come from a, a high-end uh, uh, music hardware uh, background. So, of course, uh, quality is very important to you. How do you feel in the next five years the evolution of uh, quality, sound quality, in the uh, online services is going gonna, is gonna to evolve. Uh, do you feel like we're going to move towards higher, quality, higher end recordings or do people really not care at this point? Um, I don't know. I don't know if people care that much. I think uh, an average uh, is enough. I don't know what, what the average is. 190, uh, an MP3. Uh, is that what people usually listen to? I mean, I don't, I don't myself make a difference between that and a 3 and a 60 uh, sampling rate. So, um, I think it's important, and if it's if it's possible, if the technology uh, and the bandwidth of internet allows it, it's it, it would be great to to increase that for sure. Um, now, from the hardware side, how things can maybe uh, facilitate this? Um, there's the Internet of Things, which could facilitate the streaming and you know uh, or download, in fact, because if every uh, object is connected, the object you interact with every day, if they're connected, they could either exchange. Uh, music content, or they could stream it directly. Uh, now, if it's high quality or low quality, I, I, I don't know. I think it's going to be ad hoc, and in some cases, you just want to hear, uh, like on the radio, you don't need high definition if you listen to classical and you have um, any other, you know, requires it. Yeah. Then, then I think there should be an offer for both. Yeah. So, um, I think it's not necessarily a question of quality. I think we reach a quality that is good enough for most people, but it's the accessibility, and we seem to have regions in the world where you don't have internet, so streaming is out of the question. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, for big changes in the way music is distributed when we have solved global internet problem and also internet of things and connected uh, devices that 
communicate without uh, talking to satellite first. Yeah. It's just one to one. Absolutely. And uh, moving to Switzerland, because I guess we're already almost halfway through. So, Ian, I want to talk about live. Uh, we, we're trying to do a very broad uh, score panel today and, and see if uh, we can tackle some of the big issues that are happening in music. And uh, live is seen by some people as uh, it's been a fairly monolithic industry in, in the way that it's uh, evolved, just because it has a fairly uh, you know, straightforward business model and it's, it's worked, it's been working. And, uh, uh, you know, Songkick, of course, has come in and, and introduced an element of disruption to that. Uh, but uh, it's still a long way to becoming, you know, a, a tech forward uh, uh, environment. So how do you see that evolving in the next five years as far as uh, the big groups uh, that are controlling most of the space? Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that live music is a pretty backwards industry um, in general. Um, but the, the reasons for that are quite kind of quite complex. Um, so if you give me, a, if you don't mind, I'll sort of explain it in a, a bit more detail. So sure, part of the problem comes from the fact you've got three different entities. You've got the artist, you've got the venue, and you've got the, the fan. And historically, um, there was, you know, the, the artist is in many ways, like it's a, it's a strange idea this, but the artist is a mini monopolist, right? If you're Jay-Z, and fans want to see Jay-Z, there is no other Jay-Z you can substitute in there and offer an alternative, a slightly slightly worse Jay-Z, right? Or, you know, a hologram Jay-Z that's not Jay-Z, right? You, you have to actually put Jay-Z on a stage for fans to want to buy a ticket to Jay-Z, right? Whereas when you're buying a washing machine, there are lots of different washing machines, and you can kind of compare and contrast between washing machines and buy one that maybe, you know, slightly suits your spec slightly more. So the problem with that is that the artist has incredible um, sort of power as soon as they become successful. And the artist employs a manager who helps to sort of uh, amplify that. And the art, the, in live, they employ an agent who helps to amplify that further. And what that means is that historically, the artist sort of monopolist position has been um, sort of naturally extended to the point where the amount of money that the venue was making was unsustainable. And the, the, that, that then created an opportunity for Ticketmaster and others to come in and say, okay, let's put loads of booking fees on top of the base value that you've agreed with the artist so you can still make a living, right? Which has led to a negative effect for the consumer because they end up spending more money than they should do as a result of like all this stuff not really making sense and the artist exploiting their position via the manager, via the agent, etc. cetera. Um, so that's kind of a, a weird setup, which means that power got concentrated around venues and all the big ticketing companies are actually venue-centric, not fan or artist-centric. They're all like, all about, it's all about going into a venue in Minneapolis offering them a million dollars and saying, we're going to have all your tickets for the next 10 years. And if you look at someone like Ticketmaster's SEC filings, they have deals that literally expire in 2030. So there's some pretty crazy levels of like incumbency there. Um, so it's quite a weird industry um, because of this sort of artist as monopolist. And you could look at it two ways. You can say that's a bad thing and that it creates a lot of downstream kind of net negative things on the fan. You can also say it's a good thing that artists are powerful and in control. Like I think that's a good thing as well. Yeah. Um, so the way we look at it is that things are going to get better when the artists and the fan are more directly connected. And we try to facilitate that through Songkit, we try to facilitate that through Detour. And I think the closer they are connected, the more rational these economics will become and the better things will get for everybody. Um, the second thing we, we're trying to figure out is how to sort of rebalance the equation. So everybody, the fan pays the cheapest price possible, can go to as many concerts as possible. Emerging artists don't get hurt by the fact that big artists suddenly drive their ticket prices up over $100. And the average fan in America goes just one concert a year, so it does have a real impact if superstars drive prices to the point where live music as a broader activity is unsustainable. It's not like you pay like $100 to see Iron Man, but only $5 to see an indie movie, right? They're the same price, and it means that cinema going is a more regular and consistent occurrence than, than concert going. So that's, that's the first thing um, we'd like to help, and the se help with. And the second thing we'd like to help with is just sort of rebalancing the economics. And I think more than, more than, e more than even in recorded music, that the innovation is actually going to be around business models. So, you know, we have, you know, the second largest audience of live music fans after Ticketmaster on the fan end of the spectrum. We have something approaching 100,000 artists now adding data directly to Songkick and managing their data set. So there's an opportunity for us to sort of uh, transform some of the stuff in the middle. So it's fairer for the fan, they pay a cheaper price and go to more shows. Fairer for the artists, they're getting a higher percentage of the overall gross and they're making a living on live and fairer also for the other people who need to exist, in particular the promoter and the venue. So it's complex and convoluted, but I think that we're just reaching the point when the old model is breaking enough to allow something new to come through. 
And I think that that's sort of the symptom of what's happened with Songkick and, and with Detour. So I was going to ask you guys uh, uh, the same thing asked again in the when we talk about music. So looking at uh, the live industry from a, a, an outsider's perspective of people that are working in music but are not working in the live industry, uh, how what is uh, of what Ian said because he gave us a pretty great overview of uh, of what the future of, of life is and what the, the options are. What what is exciting you about what what he talked about? And what are the things that you think is the most interesting that's going to happen in the next uh, five years or so? Uh, John Matisse, do you want to? Um, okay. You had the mic. Um, uh, I am fascinated by, by the work that um, Songkick uh, is doing and facilitating this uh, route between what people want to listen to and, and, the, and what musicians, where, where they want to play. So Detour as well is a great initiative. Um, I feel that uh, I want to describe the, the live scene in, in a different way, in a more human um, and psychological way. The, there are three dynamics that I'm interested in uh, as a technologist. There's, uh, the one is the dynamic between the performance and the audience. Uh, one, another one is the dynamic between performers themselves. That's all the creation tools and collaboration tools. And the last dynamic that most business um, facilitate as well, or uh, actually the last dynamic is actually rather uh, overlooked and ignored, is uh, the interaction between the audience, uh, members of the audience themselves. And I think uh, most business in the world aim at, uh, in the music industry, aim at facilitating and enriching one of these three dynamics. And I think if there's innovation in the future is in how um, audience together are going to be draw closer. So uh, there was this make light example that was suggested, uh, uh, which drove both actually performers and the audience together. But if you look at, at the access remotely to live concerts, how do you reproduce in a human the same experience that you would uh, have in, in a live context but remotely, you know? Uh, what is missing when you just watch at, at a screen and, and listen to the audio? And how could we innovate in making sure that we, we, we give as much as possible the impression that you hear and that you share and that you interact with people? So I think uh, solving some of these questions and some of these dynamics and exploring and trying to enrich any of these dynamics between performer and audience, between performers themselves or between audience themselves uh, or building or supporting all of, th all of the three would be um, a great vision to, to you know to, to keep in mind to create new products or, and services in the music industry. That's great, D Dave. What's your take on this? Yeah, when I when I think about, I mean, unfortunately, I don't go to that many live shows anymore because I've got two kids at home, and I, yeah, I need to get to more actually. But I, I think when I when I think about the difference between going to a gig now and going to a gig five years ago, like the only one significant difference that I can think of other than the prices seem to keep going up um, is that everybody in the audience has a mobile phone like everyone stands there with like I mean it, even like with iPads kind of you know you can't actually see over the top of them um, and uh, yeah for me I think that's well first of all it poses a really interesting question because there's a lot of artists now who are you know before they start a show they'll announce and just say no iPhones and I don't think it's I don't think it's because you know they don't like the technology or you know whatever I think it's just because you know, can you really experience the show if you're just seeing it through a tiny window? I mean, it's kind of crazy. You spend all of that money to go and see a show, and then you only actually see, you know, a kind of one by three inch uh, version of it. Um, but it does also create lots of um, huge opportunities. Um, John Baptiste actually mentioned the example I was going to bring to mind, um, which is Make Light, where it's like, okay, well, if everyone's got these screens, how can we, um, how can we take advantage of that? And for anyone who's not familiar, I think what, what they do is they. They kind of rig up the the performance, and you you uh, hold up your screen, and you're actually then part of the light show, which I think is a really really interesting dynamic. And I wonder if, as, as Jean Baptiste said, is there any other things that you can do? You know, with all of these different sensors that we have, like, is there something where you could hook up? You know, the kind of the movement of the crowd, and that somehow affects the the actual performance. Um, there's a really one of the most fun gigs that I've been to recently was a guy called Tim Exile. <laughs> Um, and I don't, don't know how kind of replicable this is because he's just got this genius talent for, for doing stuff with hardware. But um, he actually does this interactive performance where he hands around a microphone and people will actually create sound from within the audience. And then he manipulates that. And he's, he's got a live feed. So he's taking, he's actually, we did something, we did something called a live jam with him on SoundCloud where we actually announced to the SoundCloud community, send him a sound and live in the show, he will mix that into the performance. Uh, do something with it. So I think there is all sorts of really exciting things in the performance. And then the last thing 
um, I think to mention was, and I mentioned in this, this in the preamble, but um, the most amazing thing that I've seen in a live show recently was Imogen Heap uh, with these magic gloves. Um, and when I first heard, when, you know, I, I love Imogen, I think she's really creative. She's done a lot in social media as well and, and pushing the boundaries. But when I heard of these magic gloves, I was like, oh, no, this is, you know, this is going to be terrible. Um, but it wasn't. It blew me away. She had these, 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 for anyone who hasn't seen it, she's got these two gloves. Um, they've got a microphone on the, the tip of each finger. They're hooked up with uh, accelerometers. And she basically just transformed this performance um, just by kind of, you know, it was gestural movements and pulling the sound out. She had this Indian flautist who was accompanying her. And, and it just totally blew me away. It was the best performance that I've seen. It kind of, you know, actually moved me. Uh, you know, quite emotionally as well. So, yeah, I think I think those are like looking at how the crowd can then interact with the performance, but how yeah. technology is changing the performance is really interesting. And one last thing, if Jay Z ever launches a range of kitchen appliances, <laughs> I am going to be the first to comment behind that. So. Absolutely, Brittany, what's what's your take on on this debate? And uh, uh, from your perspective, how, how do you feel like live could uh, interact with uh, with an application like yours or? Uh, in any way that would mention the. Uh, I do so have far. some experience in live. Um, I was a promoter and a tour manager, um, so I have experienced the, the lowest of the low pains of dealing with this. Um, and that was about five years ago, I think maybe a little bit more even. And what we saw changing while I was there, just to kind of go back before I go forward, um, had a lot to do with mobiles and it had a lot to do with ticketing. Um, and how people were, were purchasing tickets and how they showed them to you when they turned up at a gig if you had to work the door. Um, you know, it went from everyone printing off pieces of paper to just like shoving an email in your face. Um, and there was a lot of kind of innovation around, I don't know if you guys know about a company called Music Glue, um, around kind of trying to sort of allow people to have their own kind of barcode readers and make things a little more sensible and give the artists a little bit more control over that as well. Um, I think. What's interesting around mobiles, which is a good point, that now everyone does have a mobile in their bag or in their pocket, is what's going to happen with the kind of newer technologies around mobile. So I'm, I'm going to hop on the iOS 7 bandwagon. But while everyone's been kind of like banging on about something like iBeacons, um, which for those of you if you're not familiar with the technology, it's basically very low powered Bluetooth. So it means you're kind of constantly like pinging something out and someone can ping something back to you. Um, it's on all the time. Um, and I think the idea of going to a gig and maybe you're going and you went to see the headliner, you turned up early, you're seeing the people playing before, if they can kind of automatically send you something that like you were here and you saw this person, that could be incredibly powerful. And the, being able to sort of ping to you directly like this is their website or this is their fa Facebook page or their song kick page or their SoundCloud page and you can then follow that person from then on. Almost as though you're kind of creating for yourself a sort of um, like perpetual breadcrumb trail of the music you've listened to. Um, I think there's a lot of possibilities in the technology that's available with that to kind of help people get more out of their live experience and to help them hang on to that, which is something that is traditionally really difficult to do. Um, you know, how do you how do you maintain the experience of seeing a band live? Because um, like watching a video on YouTube just really isn't quite the same. Um, and anything you can do to, to keep people's attention as well, because um, that's also a big thing, and to keep them connected is going to be a big deal. And there's a lot of possibilities there. And I'd like to see some some people get in and do it. It's it's not really for us. Um, it's probably more for you, Ian. But um, I think there's a lot of potential there. Yeah. And uh, looking at the, we're moving into the last section, which is uh, looking at the creators and how they uh, they're going to uh, handle the next uh, five, uh, ten years. Uh, uh, I want to bridge the discussion on, on hardware and talking about how, they, how to create music with a discussion, just a, a quick overview on, on your thoughts on crowdfunding. Of course, we touched uh, uh, upon Detour, which I think is super exciting, a super exciting development in the live music industry, and I can't wait for it to roll out to more countries and, and uh, become a bigger thing and see, and see how that uh, works out. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Uh, and on the recorded side as well, uh, live music is doing amazing work. Uh, how do you feel uh, crowdfunding and direct to fan uh, uh, are going to play uh, into the evolution of uh, the way uh, musicians uh, put themselves out there, uh, both as independents and as label-backed musicians. And and how do you, uh, where do you see that going, uh, Dave? Um, so the question is how 
How do you, how, how do you feel crowdfunding is going to evolve in the next five years, both for independents and for uh, label backed musicians? Right. Yeah. Um, so I mean, kind of touching on the direct to fan part first. I think I think that is really important, um, and I think it was you know that's been one of the big trends in in the industry for the last five years is how do they you know if we can reach the consumer then we can sell them more product at a higher premium, etc. Um, I actually don't think in the last five years that's quite lived up to the hype. I think yeah. a lot of people were talking about it and it, it was hugely successful, but maybe we overestimated like the, the, the size of the opportunity that's out there. Um, and I think somehow it's the same thing. It's like with the, you know, if I, if I look at subscription music services, I mean, any subscriptions, any subscription model on Netflix, you know, it's only ever going to reach a certain percentage of the, um, uh, of the population, um, so I think direct uh, direct to fan is really really valuable because what it does do is it, it kind of focuses on the the kind of the real fans, the ones that are prepared to pay a lot of money, and then you know kind of extracts the appropriate amount of value from that transaction. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important to not forget about the rest of the you know ninety eight percent of the population who might not be in that. I think one of the one of the mistakes we sometimes make as the industry is. Like everyone in the music industry, and usually within the technology industry, we're always huge music in like music fans ourselves. So we always, when we're building products, we always go from that mindset first, and we forget about you know people like my wife who might want to spend money, um, you know, on a show or you know on CDs, but but like gets left behind. But anyway, I'm I'm kind of <laughs> going off topic slightly. Um, but when it comes to crowdfunding, I think that is you know we're seeing on Kickstarter. There is projects where people feel so passionate about them. Um, if you can tap directly into that, you can raise the money and you can get things happening. And it's an extremely efficient way um, of raising funds. And I think yeah. it's, yeah. I, I think Jean-Baptiste has a couple of direct examples that I heard about recently, so he should probably comment more. But um, Jean-Baptiste, uh, what's the take? I mean, on a slightly more controversial, controversial uh, uh, point of view, you know, I, I could say, you know, the last couple of years have been great for uh, direct to fan on, on the music sales front because it feels like a novelty. So people are, are finding out all these ways that they can interact with their artists that they didn't have before. Is that going to die down, or is it is it something that a relationship that can keep on being built on? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. The question. Like, um, uh, do you feel like in, you know the novelty of direct to fan and all these offers, like you know having an artist play in your living room or having different ways of interacting with them? Are going to keep being exciting for fans uh, for the for the foreseeable future, or is there an element of uh, excitement that might die down in the next few years of, over that model? Okay, well, I'll do my best to answer that, but I'm really not a well placed, I think, to, to answer sure. that. I, I love the model direct to fan. I think it's uh, yeah. it's great. There's so many middlemen. We had this conversation before with Ian uh, because of the panel, and there's so many middlemen in the old business model that um, doesn't facilitate creating new economies and, and facilitates a route from uh, well, desire to listen to something to, to actually uh, engaging with the artist. So, um, well, this is probably as much as I can yeah, uh, sure. comment on that. But Absolutely. on the Kickstarter front, uh, there's this new hardware uh, revolution. I don't know if it's a revolution, but at least it's easier to make hardware. Yeah. And um, I'm a founder of the Music Hack Space, which is a collective of art, uh, artists and hackers. And uh, we had uh, this summer two Kickstarter projects. Uh, Building hardware. One of them is a, is a guitar pedal that you can reprogram, and they only aimed at uh, raising ten thousand pounds or something like that. They didn't end up raising thirty-five thousand, which is uh, great. I mean, they all have jobs. Uh, it's four guys together, and they all have jobs, and and, yeah. and it's an opportunity to create a new business. And it's a hardware business. It's really difficult to you know to get a manufacturing chain and and do the all the electronics and build the product product design and so forth. Uh, we have another product which is called Touch Keys, and which uh, also was successful over the summer. Um, clearly, Kickstarter and crowdfunding in general not only brings uh, this initial capital infusion that is vital to hardware, but also it validates the demand. You know, if, if you make a good demonstrator and a good prototype, uh, which is easier now with Arduinos and all these um, uh, bricks of uh, technologies that you can assemble together without a very in-depth knowledge. Uh, as soon as you have this prototype and demonstrator, you can validate the demand and raise uh, quite a lot of money. And, uh, one of the most recent uh, success in Kickstarter was this 3D printer that just wanted $100,000 and, <coughs> and raised $3 million instead. Uh, so there are some great stories where there's demand um, for people.
people to, to find out. And in yeah. music in particular, uh, it's, it's, it's a great, great tool for music creators and, and hardware manufacturers. Yeah, sure. And, and uh, staying with you for a second, just uh, what, what do you feel are the trends in the hardware side for musicians that are creating music and they want to uh, create more music with new devices and, and make exciting uh, new sounds? Uh, how, does, how is that evolving? Do you feel like there is a, a trend towards creating completely new interfaces? Uh, and uh, if so, how do those relate to, to perhaps older style instruments that, that we may be all used to? I think there's one mainstream trend, which is uh, the, what is called the controllerist movement. I don't know if you've heard of, of this controllerism. Uh, it's about uh, pads uh, or grids of buttons that you control and that are used to control DJ software. Uh, so it's very uh, well known now. It, it's been uh, started with a uh, Roger Lin is in the 80s with a drum machine, uh, became the MPC, and now we have Machina from Native Instrument and other. Um, and what is interesting in there is that people develop a, a virtuosity as using these instruments, and they're really quick and, and rapid, and I'm sure you, you've seen some of them. At the same time, it's, uh, it breaks away from traditional musicianship. So there is a new musicianship that, that is created through that. Uh, I don't want to pitch my, my company, but. <laughs> There's one thing that we're trying to do with, with, with the Seaboard at Rolly is to reuse the musicianship of playing the piano and augment that with new expressions. And I feel that if there is an innovation, not only by us, but by other uh, manufacturers in the future, it, it should be about lifelong skills and the development of, um, of this musicianship and things that you are familiar with uh, and that are augmented. So I think one, one innovation is about uh, humanizing more technology, making it more to your hand rather than to your head. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ian, uh, on, on the live front, uh, that's a huge movement in having uh, more and more new gadgets on stage. You know, we started with the iPads a few years ago, and now we have all sorts of controller controllers uh, with uh, loads of buttons that artists are having fun with. And so, how, how do you see that progressing? Uh, Dave was talking about Imogen Heap and her glove, and uh, I remember being super excited when I saw uh, Bjork uh, play with the, uh, the React table, that table that she used to uh, play with uh, five or six years ago, and that was sort of one of the first things that I saw in, in that space. Uh, do you see a, a lot more of that uh, on, on the live music front as well? Uh, yeah, we do. I mean, I think, um, I guess for me, like taking a kind of a, a really long view on live music, live music has always been the main form of music since like dawn of time, right? But there was this one like major crazy change when someone invented like massive amps, right? And you could go from playing to a bunch of people in a room to like a field full of 100,000 people. And I don't think we've seen anything come along that's at that level. But I think, you know, we'll see more stuff that does change the live experience with cool hardware stuff there. Although I have to say, like in general, I'm, I don't know, like for me, the, the, what's the reason I, I was, you know, spent the last six years of my life working on live music is because I kind of like the purity of the live experience. For me, like, you know, the inspiration for setting up Songkick was all about just going to shows and having that incredible connection with an artist and it not being sort of mediated by loads of weird technology left, right and center. It's just like coming out the speakers and you're there. Um, and I think all of, you know, just to sort of loop that back to crowdfunding, I think the, the exciting thing about crowdfunding and crowdsourcing is that I think the web is increasingly allowing us to take the, the emotional energy you feel when you're standing in a room in front of one of your favorite artists, listening to them play and looking at them being part of a crowd and figuring out how to sort of bring a bit of that energy online in a way that enables either that experience to happen more efficiently, which is things like Detour, or just more generally the artists and the bands have a sort of more productive relationship. And I think Kickstarter is probably the the one of the best design products of the last 10 years. There's so many ways in which it's brilliant. Um, but I think more than anything, what they've managed to do is they've managed to capture the em emotional connection between an artist and a fan, um, and lots of different fans. You know, a fan will pay $1 for something, a fan will pay $5,000. And, you know, when I go on there and I, you know, back Spike Lee's my, like, latest film or, you know, my friend's game or something like that, like, the emotion I feel is one of the, it's one of the most emotional experiences I have online. And I think that, everything interesting that's going to happen from crowdfunding, crowdsourcing is really going to be about figuring out how to do such exquisite product design that you manage to do justice to what a fan really feels when they love an artist and what artists really feels when they're trying to communicate their art to, to, to their fan base. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dave, we started talking about the Internet of Things uh, in, the, in the very first couple of questions uh, the session today. And uh, that's another area where perhaps we're going to see uh, a bit of evolution on the hardware front of music as people are able to interact uh, 
uh, with uh, objects that perhaps are not designed for music, but in a musical way. Like I'm thinking about the leap, for example, if anybody's seen it, it's that little uh, square sensor that you can uh, sort of wave your hand, uh, hand around over and it's very precise, it can tell where your hand is. Uh, although it's sort of still evolving, the, the jury's still out there on that one. Yeah, not that precise. Uh, but yeah, so how do you how do you see that evolving? I, I know that there's loads of uh, musical, uh, you know, geeks and people that love like making their music soundcloud as well. Uh, how do you see that space uh, uh, taking over? Yeah, crikey, big question. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, one thing through. I mean, uh, you know, a couple of years ago now, um, I started an event called Music Hack Day, and one of the things that we deliberately tried to do at the event was get people in different disciplines. So we would have a room full of people just making hardware. We would have a room full of people just doing mobile apps. We would have software people. We'd try and have musicians. And I think what's interesting about that stuff is seeing where the synergies are between all those things. And it's funny because at those events, you know, you were, you were having hacks where people were getting like Wii controllers and, you know, doing the most like kind of almost, almost silly things. Or they would, you know, make, uh, you know, the amount of times I've seen a, you know, a theremin that is whatever. Um, you know, made out of a, um, you know, a, a leaf or something like yeah. that. So, yeah, I, I don't have a really, a really strong answer on that, but it's just, I think John Baptiste kind of maybe kind of hinted at what, what was next in that you have, as soon as you have all these objects that can talk to each other, um, and not just, you know, connected devices, but, you know, things that can be interacting and exchanging data and, and also visualizing some of that, those things as well. Um, I've always kind of been interested in the thought that, um, I'm kind of going off topic now a little bit, but there was a, a Kickstarter project which was, um, you know, a lamp that lit up when someone else did something. So I've always yeah. been, you know, if if my favorite artist has just, you know, if Jay Z has just, uh, you know, launched his new track, why couldn't my my music device glow and get me excited that something's happened? Or I know there's lots of things around that, but I'm not sure what they are. So. Yeah, sure, um, Brittany. Uh, the, the last question, I guess, is around skills. So we're talking about uh, all these different devices. Uh, that are out there, uh, there are devices that are making it uh, uh, so much easier to create music and, uh, and interact with it. And uh, there are also some devices that perhaps are not designed for music that might allow people access to music making uh, facilities without actually actively having to go out and purchase a, a keyboard controller or anything like that. So how do you feel skills uh, end up entering into this equation? And do you feel like people need less skills to do music or is it just an evolution of the process? Um, I guess that kind of depends on your definition of music. Um, so there's a number of apps that exist now that are kind of sort of straddle between kind of a sort of pro am application and a toy. Um, I think one is uh, I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's called Figure by a company called Propellerhead, um, and it kind of brings sort of three things together, like a drum machine. Um, it's got a bass synth, I think, and a lead synth, a keyboard. Um, and you can kind of drag around on it and make something that sounds like not terrible. I'm, I am not someone you want making music anywhere near you. And you can kind of play around with this thing and it doesn't sound like shit. Um, and I think there's this kind of movement towards allowing people who don't have any sort of knowledge about music theory or any actual practical skills to be able to play around with sound and make something that doesn't just sound like completely horrible, which is what I would sound like if you handed me like piano. Um, whether or not that will translate into people actually doing kind of productive things in music, music, I think yeah. is still to be determined. Um, I think it is more of a kind of a good introduction. Um, Bjork, again, like the entire Beophilia app project was actually about music theory um, through gaming. gaming. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to be, to be seen in whether or not someone can find a way to bridge that gap between these sort of music toys and helping that become a process to turn someone into more of a professional musician. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just wanted to jump in on that. I, I, it, it was it's a it's a topic that I think uh, we at SoundCloud and myself personally are very interested in. There's there's always this, this debate of um, you know is it bad to put the, these tools in the hands of amateurs and does it water things down and I think there's always, I think if you are a professional musician, you always feel like, well, two things. It's you know, number one, it's kind of a threat, but it's also, well, hang on, you know, I've spent all these years and somebody could just pick something up and that isn't really music. Um, but I always go back to one fairly cheesy example, um, which is, I don't know if anyone remembers the IMT Pain app that was uh, made by Smule, which was one of the first apps on the iPhone. It just got ridiculously popular overnight. And yes, it was cheesy, it was gimmicky, but I think when you, when you look at the impact of that, 
like if you think I, I can't remember the stats now but it was something like in the first couple of weeks of the app they had 20 million recordings which you know each one of those individual recordings is kind of worthless right i mean it's not it doesn't stand up on its own as a as a creation or as a musical work but when you when you think that there's 20 million of them that's the same as the entire recorded music industry. You know, that's the, that's the whole catalog on iTunes. Yeah. So, so there is something, like I'm not saying that those 20 million are the same value as the 20 million that are on, on iTunes, but there is a huge impact there. And to give a more tangible example, which kind of comes up slightly up the, the chain on musical creation is, um, you know, a lot of people use SoundCloud to put out their stems or put out acapellas and things like that. We did two examples, 50 Cent put out, he just kind of uploaded, a, um, a uh, freestyle onto his uh, SoundCloud page, and then he had thousands and thousands of, of people and like you know kids in their bedrooms producing a beat and then sending them back to him. Or we have someone like Beyonce who you know released the stems to one of her tracks. And again, looking at the numbers there, if Beyonce, um, you know, she recently put up a, a track "Bow Down" on the platform, which was the world premiere, and put it on a Tumblr, and it was powered through SoundCloud. And she did I don't know like a couple of million listens or something. But just before that, she'd done a remix contest where she just put the stems out to a new track. It didn't even need to have been a, a hit track. Um, and she had about 3,000 people remix that track. And again, each individual listen, probably the, the, the biggest one had maybe 10, 50,000 plays, something like that. But in aggregate, they did about 3 million listens. So the, the sum of that crowd and those creations is arguably, if you're just measuring it in terms of listens and impact and engagement, was more val valuable than the kind of the big one-off hit. So yeah. I think there's, uh, underline that, there's something incredibly powerful there that we shouldn't forget. Absolutely. And I, I feel like we have to wrap this, this up, unfortunately, but uh, maybe we have time for a couple of questions from the audience, if uh, there are any. Just so kind of we touched earlier, Ian, you were kind of talking about the uh, relationship of uh, all the kind of artists starting to make their own teams um, rather than kind of having uh, label support. I was just wondering what your perspective was on brands coming into the space and kind of disrupting label model but like, do you think that there's any uh, scope for brands to be moving in and um, having a more direct relationship with artists and kind of building relationships between artists and brands more directly kind of leapfrogging uh, major labels uh, I think in general what brands do in terms of getting in between an audience and you know the artist is usually insanely boring and I think most of the, the sort of branded record labels are like about as boring as you could possibly get um, in terms of what they achieve and what they sort of do with artists. It's like very self-serving and, and doesn't really push things forward. But I think there is an opportunity to basically take the money that they they have that they would like to use to endear themselves to consumers and reach new consumers to do stuff that really provocatively moves things forward. So just as a simple example, like someone like American Express, right? They spend crazy amounts of money sponsoring ticketing companies, whatever else, probably to the tune of $50 million a year, right? Instead, why don't they take um, a great act and say, we're going to figure out how to sort out the economics behind the scenes so the promoter makes enough money, the venue makes enough money, the artist makes enough money, and cap booking fees at 10% and keep the ticket price down for the fan. Put that money into, into doing that. And that kind of thing I think they could be doing, but I think most people who work at brands trying to do this stuff aren't really thinking that progressively about it. But I think there's an opportunity to, just because there's so much money sloshing around, to actually come in and really radically shake up the economics. Um, but what most people tend to do is just hire some dude out of a label and say, oh, go sort this out. And it ends up exactly the same as it's always been. Yeah, I think one, just to jump in on that question as well, I think one thing that's really interesting and in specifically within a kind of social media setting, like if you, if you look at the way brands are approaching platforms like a Facebook or a Tumblr or Twitter is it's all about turning up on those platforms and A, being relevant, um, and B being native to those platforms. So if if you're a, if you're a brand, like how do you go and be native on a platform like that unless you've got great content? So I think there's a huge opportunity there for for brands to figure out. And I think they're starting to figure it out. And like Ian says, I think you're kind of going to see a kind of you know a 90% fail rate at start, but hopefully it will get better and better. And we've definitely seen some great examples. There's some companies like Red Bull who have really invested in that space, so they actually have credibility from the get go. Um, but I think yeah, if 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 there's a way of really figuring out those per partnerships that are mutually beneficial and ideally kind of well thought, well thought through, because if, if they're not, they're not going to be relevant. They're not going to see the kind of the metrics coming back. So it, hopefully it's going to be self-selecting. But I think it, it, it could be a really big opportunity. Anybody else? 
I was interested to hear about um, sort of the live uh, rewarding fans at shows uh, system, and obviously you mentioned Bluetooth. Um, I worked with a few different artists, and we came up against a lot of issues last year in terms of how we reward our fans at the shows. And I wondered whether there was, and that was at big venues like the O2 Arena in London. Um, I wondered if any of you guys, in particular Songkick, had done like activations where you had rewarded fans at shows at this point, or whether you'd also met those challenges. So we're just getting into it actually, and you know we're just starting to do some stuff, kind of quite experimentally around contacting artists, fans before and after the show on behalf of the artists, either either with working with them or not. And one of the things I'm really excited about is um, we've been sending people like as a little experiment in London. Um, so as a bit of context, like. Bands play support slots, you'll obviously know this, but they play support slots to reach a new audience, right? That's their goal. They're supporting the main band so they can hopefully make some new fans in the process. They usually don't get paid anything for doing that, or sometimes they have to pay to play a support slot, so it's pretty broken. And oftentimes fans don't turn up and see the support. It kind of just doesn't really work actually that well as a system, but bands still see it as a great opportunity. Um, so we've started um, for shows where we've been kind of selling tickets and stuff like that, where we actually know a lot of the people going. We've been sending them emails the day of the show saying, okay, first of all, here are the set times. That's something everyone, for every fan wants to know. The first band's on at seven, next is on at eight, next is on at nine. But also, you know, you're probably going to see this band, but here is some interesting press about want this support band. Here's a link to some stuff on SoundCloud. And just sort of getting people teed up to get excited about going and seeing their support acts. And I think the same thing we can help with when it comes to merch purchases or live recording purchases. I'm really excited about it because I think it's a way of helping artists um, achieve what they're ultimately trying to do with the show. And I think, you know, it's, it's gradual, but I think there's lots we could, lots we could do there. So yeah, we, we'd love to talk about that. So we actually um, did a very analog version of this once upon a time where we would get to, with one band, we said, if you tag like the band in any Facebook photos you put up from the gig, we'll send you an MP3. Um, and this was, this must have been 2007. Um, and it was kind of, for us, it was exactly that. And it was like, we just did like an MVP of something that probably could have been an actual business without knowing what it was. It was just simply a way for us to be able to actually stay in touch with them and give them something for turning up. Um, we did it with a much bigger band who played on um, a massive show in um, Coventry. Um, where everyone who went and tweeted about it, we sent the album to them, like a digital copy of the album. Um, and that was like a, a number three album last year. Um, and I think there are ways to do it without having to rely on services. Like you can have that kind of stuff yourself if you want to. Um, you just have to be a little bit creative about it. And eventually like, I, people like Songkick, and I'm sure there will be other people as well, will come up with other ways for you to, to kind of have those relationships. You can definitely do it yourself and just kind of test stuff out and see what works for your fan bases. Hi, um, this is kind of a big question, but it's to tap into the point about, uh, about trends though. And what I want to ask really is, does the panel think we're getting to a stage when there's actually too much uh, music out there, there are too many bands at the moment? And we may, we may end up in a stage where people can't, can't process that anymore necessarily. I say this um, as someone who works in radio, we do look, and Davis, this goes back to a few of your points, we do look at the social data and the fan bases they have and the play counts of these big artists get necessarily, and that, that has a big part of what we cover. I've also worked as a music journalist for indie sites like Jordan Sound. The quietest I've seen on the inverse that those younger bands, those more niche bands, have a bigger and bigger problem in getting any kind of visibility out there within the social space and within, the, within those sites as well, which then has a knock-on effect on the ability for people to create fan bases because they can get exposure for a song, but the ability to create a sustainable fan base off the back of there being too many bands means that we may not have that glorious model that we can hopefully tap into to create, you know, crowdfunding to 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 get the kind of data that a radio station might care about in the first place. Are we at a risk where this may actually collapse because there's simply too much information out there? Yeah, I think that there's a couple of strands to that actually, and this somebody um, Ben Drury from Seven Digital had very similar question on a panel yesterday and um, and he said uh, one thing that I had never considered but he said that actually for the services themselves they're asking themselves that question it's like oh crikey you know only only 10% of our catalogs are actually getting accessed and you know some of the some of the engineers are starting to say can we just delete some of this crap off our servers <laughs> so you know there, there's some you know serious logistic problems they also have 
And this is more with, with consumer music services, but you also have the problem of people creating sound alikes and you know, anyone can upload any content through Tunecore. And obviously in, in SoundCloud, that, that's in spades. And that's part of the beauty of our platform is that we have you know, the broadest spectrum of sound possible from, you know, I have the first two minutes of my second baby's life on SoundCloud. You know, I also have, you know, like my, my son's, you know, singing happy birthday, etc. cetera. So, um, so yeah, but, but to address the, the other point, um, I think it comes back to the tyranny of choice, right? And that's where, I think in the next five years, now we do have that choice, that's where some of this innovation is gonna come from. Um, and I think there's a couple of ways of solving it. Like, first of all, if you think about a music service, you zoom out, you say, right, on a platform like Spotify, you maybe every service has the same 15 to 20 million tracks. Now, you cut that down, I mean, Pandora is one of the kind of the most listened to music services. They only have something like 700,000. So you don't certainly don't need to uh, those uh, 20,000. But then if you look at a, you mentioned radio, if you look at NRJ, a, a radio station in France, at any one time, they've only got 10 tracks on the playlist. Yet, like the majority of France is listening to that radio station, so you don't need the whole catalogue. It's how what is your role as a curator in that? Like NRJ have said, right, we want to cater to a mainstream. We're going to say, right, these are ten tracks. We're going to put them in rotation. So I think there's a huge role for radio people to come in and say, this is how we can program better. Um, and then there's the technology side, which says, well, how can we take all of the the data cues from social media, like so, what's buzzing on Twitter, or you know, how many plays it's got. You know, be building smarter algorithms, and um, yeah, again, you could do another two panels on this. And I'm almost Absolutely. kind of bored of the human versus yeah. machine <laughs> curation topic, um, but it's it's so relevant. It's it, it needs to be solved. Absolutely, uh, I think uh, we might need to close it down because uh, we're like 50 minutes late, and I don't want to make all the other panels late. Uh, so, uh, thanks so much, guys. Uh, it was really good fun, and I hope you enjoyed it. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the panel. Have a great week, and until next time. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.